All right, today is Monday, March 28, 2011. My name is Jennifer Fording, and I'll be interviewing Georgiana Heizanga as part of the Elmore Oral History Series for the Elmore Historical Society. Good morning, Georgie. Good morning, Jennifer. <laughs> Let's see here. So I guess we'll start at the beginning. So where did you grow up? <laughs> I actually grew up um, in eastern Ohio, um, in Maslin, Ohio originally, and then we moved to Alliance when I was in sixth grade. So I graduated from Alliance High School, went to Bowling Green, uh, met my husband there, and uh, we lived in Bowling Green for a while when we were first married and then moved to Oregon, Ohio, briefly. We lived there for five years, and I worked at uh, the Great Eastern Branch of the Wood County Public Library, and then we moved to Elmore in 1974, um, and when the job opening came up here when Grace retired in 1993. I applied for it and I became the director in 1993. But uh, we had, um, I had started out in 1970 as a reference librarian at Great Eastern Branch and then eventually became branch manager and when the library moved to Wabridge was branch manager there until 1993. So going back to um, when you lived in Alliance in Eastern Ohio, um, could you tell me a little bit about your family? Okay, I um, my parents were um, Blair and Mildred Shears, and I have one sister, Martha, who now lives in New Jersey. Um, had a normal childhood. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was active in high school in uh, drama club and. Newspaper. I was featured editor of our local of our high school newspaper. Uh, I actually started out with interest in journalism, but there wasn't a lot of encouragement for women in journalism at that time. And once you wanted to do um, social column, and that didn't really interest <laughs> me. So uh, I switched majors to. I was an English major at Bowling Green, and minor in library science. My mom was originally was uh, worked at the Rodman Public Library in Alliance. She was a library aide there. Started out worked on the bookmobile, and then worked in the children's department at Rodman. Then she also she left there and was the library media person at Morgan Elementary School for a number number of years. So I guess it's in our blood because mm -hmm. my sister is a is a school librarian in New Jersey now, and my daughter worked here at the library when she was in high school. Before I was working here, I was still at Great Eastern then, and Andy actually worked here when he was in high school too. So I guess it's in our blood, but we, uh, you know, we were the Alliance Aviators, which was one of the highlights of my senior year was being Maslin, <laughs> which we were big rivals with Maslin High School. And the big thing was uh, the number 46, because we beat them 46 to nothing. <laughs> and uh, Maslin, I think, was having an off year that year, <laughs> because normally they were a real powerhouse in football. But that were, those were the things I was involved in in high school, was journalism, and I was in high school plays. I enjoyed that, too. In college, um, I was, uh, like I said, I started out in journalism, but then switched over to library science. Um, I actually worked for a while when I first graduated from Bowling Green. I had worked for uh, about a year or so at the university library. I worked in the cataloging department and government documents. And of course, that was before everything was automated. The big thing about government doc documents, we had a rolling card catalog. And it was when the li university library was brand new. And there were a lot of tours going, and we had to push the button on the rolling ca card catalog and show them how it worked. It was very, very, you know, very much. Uh, that was the closest thing to automation we had at that time because we had the old, you know, drawer catalog, that kind of thing. But uh, 
what, what are the differences between the um, university library and public library? I know there's differences, but I mean, what did you like better? Was um, I liked the fact that um, when I was at the university library, we had a faculty ID card, which was pretty <laughs> cool. Uh, we also, I actually, I liked it, but I missed children's, um, and I missed the adult services as far as, as far as fiction. It was more that basically what I did when I was in the catalog department was file catalog cards, and that was not exactly fun. It was boring. <laughs> um, but the government documents, we had a little more leeway. It was sort of interesting, actually. Um, things were classified very differently in the government documents department than they were. They didn't use Dewey up there. It was a special government documents um, um, cataloging system. But it was kind of interesting. It, you know, we would get things from, you know, the federal government and occasionally we didn't get a lot of patrons up there. Uh, professors we did. Uh, we had to deal with professors which are, <laughs> weren't always fun. But I missed the general public. Um, and I knew I didn't want to stay at the university library. Uh, I was actually, when I graduated from college, was offered a job at Toledo Public Library. Um, in the children's department downtown, but at that time we only had one car, and I was then offered the job at the university library, and it was within walking distance to my house, so, and plus it paid more than the uh, public library did, so I took that. I was actually almost all set to take the one at Toledo Public, but we would have had to get a second car and do some, or my husband would have had to drive me. Um, so we ended up staying, we couldn't find an apartment in Toledo that we liked in the neighborhood. So we ended up, we stayed in Bowling Green, we lived in Bowling Green. So I worked at the university library until my daughter was born. And then I took about two years off. Um, and got a job at the Great Eastern Branch. It was just part-time. I just happened to be in there as a patron, and I had put my application in when we moved up there. And at that time, I just wanted part-time because Jenny was only two. And the, it happened to be a day that the library director was there, and she said, oh, we never have any openings here. We have a lot in Bowling Green, but not here. Well, then, Within a couple months, our one of the librarians there quit, and the other librarian said, well, we have no idea who to get. And she said, well, I was talking to one of your patrons who applied. So they called me, and I was shocked. So I went in, was working part-time, and it was nice. I could work around, I could work just the evenings and Saturdays, so I didn't have to get a sitter for my daughter. So that worked out really well for me. And then we got so, so busy and uh, all of a sudden our circulation started, started picking up and they needed me to work more hours. So uh, I ended up sending my daughter to daycare. But uh, yeah, we weren't that busy and then after, I always say, well, yeah, it's because I was hired, we got busy. <laughs> But then it went from part-time time to full-time. So, uh, and then when the branch manager left, I became branch manager there. And eventually, um, the village of Wabridge had wanted a library there for a long time. And they campaigned very hard to get it. And they offered to donate the land for the library and to build it for Wood County. And originally they were talking about having two libraries, one at Great Eastern and one at Wabridge. Well, Great Eastern raised their rent, and it wasn't worth it since Wabridge was only a couple miles down, down the road. They decided to close Great Eastern and just have the Wabridge branch. So the town built it for us, but then the uh, Wood County paid, paid them back, so it, Wood County now owns the building there. 
So you had mentioned your uh, two kids before. You want to tell me a little about them? Okay, Jenny, um, my kids are 11 years apart, which <laughs> is kind of unusual. Um, I didn't want to have two kids in daycare at the same time, so that's why I waited so long to have my second one. Um, Jenny is married and lives in Maumee, works for a medical billing company. She graduated from Bowling Green. Andy lives in Cincinnati and works for General Electric. Electric. He married his high school sweetheart, and uh, they're expecting their, their first child in April. What's the baby's name? Anything? Alexander. I like that name. <laughs> I do, too. <laughs> And I've already bought the book, Alexander and the Hor Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day, to read to him eventually. That's appropriate. <laughs> um, so let's move on to Elmore a little bit. You said you moved here in 74? 74. Okay. And um, where, where did you live first? We lived on the corner of Rice um, and Clinton Street on the point. Um, which they refer to where there's a World War II monument. No, I guess it's a World War I monument. And what the notable thing about that lot is uh, the Memorial Day service is held in our yard. So um, after we lived here for a year or two, our church uh, couples group started having a Memorial Day brunch. Uh, and people would... Uh, come and stand in our yard and watch the speaker from the Memorial Day Parade, and then they'd stay at our house and have brunch, and we'd have a picnic in the yard, and so that was kind of, uh, if I'd say, where do you, if somebody'd say, where do you live? Oh, we live on the point, and it was the old Jones house at that time. In fact, an older lady that used to, you know, she's since gone, uh, came over and saw it one time because she was real interested in what we'd done to it when we lived there. It was an old house that had been added on to. In fact, you could see at one point where there was a door underneath the wallpaper. So we never were able to find too much about the house history, but it had been added on to at one time. And we lived there until... 1998, both our kids grew up there. It was nice, they could walk to school from there. Uh, when Jenny was little, the elementary, um, even though it's a consolidated school district, uh, it, if you lived in Woodville, you went to elementary school in Woodville, and if you lived in Elmore, you went to elementary school in Elmore. And then for middle school, everybody went to Woodville and then came back to the to Elmore to high school. So now it's different. It's now it's K through one K through um K through six is at Woodville and uh, seven through twelve is at Elmore. And I think they did it to save money and make the busing a little easier. But it was nice because she could walk to school mm -hmm. and Andy could walk to school and pick up the bus there too. So it was nice having being in town when the kids were young and they could walk to their or ride their bikes to their friends' houses. Did anything interesting ever happen at the point? I know you lived across the street from the graveyard. <laughs> Nothing much. Um, I had always kind of hoped the house was haunted, but I never heard anything strange <laughs> going on. <laughs> there are a couple other houses on Rice Street mm -hmm. that are considered to be a friend of ours that uh, lived down the street. She was sure she saw old Mr. Mominy in there one time, <laughs> but I'm not sure. But no, I've never seen any strange um, uh, sights or anything in that house. It is an interesting graveyard, and I know when my mom was living, she used to like to come and walk through it and look at the uh, stones, because there's a lot of Civil War graves that are there, and you can tell um, a lot of children uh, that were died at a certain time that you could see there had been some type of ep epidemic at one time or another. And I, we always thought it was pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. And another thing about that location, we were right across the street from Reed's Hill, which all the kids like to slide on. And so ours was the house you went to after you went sledding and came into the house for hot chocolate. In fact, the kids would leave their sleds on our porch, <laughs> or we would leave 
even if our kids weren't home, we would leave slides on the porch that the kids could come and use. So nice. Um, and it was kind of nice because I could go up in the bedroom and look out if my kids were out there and keep an eye on them that way because I could see, you know. And actually, Andy did break his arm down there one time <laughs> on Reed's Hill. So it went down the wrong way and hit a tree. But uh, that was the sledding place at that time. I think it still is probably. They still sled down there? Um, how has Elmer changed since you've been here? Um... You know, it hasn't changed a whole lot. There's not a lot of changes. We've seen a lot of things fluctuate. At one time, we had quite a few little businesses, but the economy really hurt. Um, we have an active chamber of commerce, but unfortunately, some of the, many of the businesses have gone out. For a while, it was doing very well, but with the economy tanked, uh, some of the small businesses were having trouble making it. Of course, Shadell's has been a big uh, draw for people. There are people that are drawn to our downtown section when Shadell's is open, open during the summertime. Um, and we have the little red, white, and brew coffee shop, which is definitely people come from the area and have lunch or coffee and donuts in the morning, and they're usually pretty busy. Um, I would like to see more businesses come into town because Elmore is too small to support the businesses on their own. And if there are more, bring more people, tourists and that kind of thing. We did have that going for a while, but I think it's just too hard for small businesses to make it in this economy. Um, I know the red, white, and blue did close this year, and she was holding on for a long time. And she, you know, didn't want to close it, but, you know, it just wasn't um, fiscally responsible for her to keep it running. She couldn't afford it. She put a lot into it. Mm -hmm. um, there is a new shop down in the other end of the, that has things on consignment that have, I don't know how many artists, which is pretty cute, but I don't know if they're going to make it either. But it's very nice. They have limited hours, which hurts. Mm -hmm. So those are the changes. Um, at the time they put the Turnpike Exchange in out here, there were a lot of dire predictions. There were predictions that our businesses would be booming because of it, and also predictions that we'd have drug dealers and everything like that, which neither th neither item has happened. Um, it hasn't had the negative effect that some people thought, and it hasn't had the real positive effects. Because it's not used a lot. Uh, my husband, right after he retired, worked part-time at the Turnpike, and he said half the people that came through thought they were getting off at 280, <laughs> and you have to direct them to go back. So the Turnpike hasn't had the big end, other than make it more convenient for Elmore residents. Mm -hmm. I have to ask um, everybody this question because I think it makes for interesting stories, but where were you during the blizzard of 78? <laughs> um, I was here, and we were living in Elmore. Um, fortunately, you know, because it hit like at 3 o'clock in the morning, and most people weren't out in it. But it was pretty neat because we never lost power here in Elmore. In some of the rural areas, they did. I mean, the lights flickered a couple times, and you couldn't get in or out of Elmore. But we coped, we walked. I remember one of the things I remember most strongly there were a lot of truckers who were stranded up on the turnpike, and people from town went up in snowmobiles to bring them in. And they kept them overnight in the church basement of the Methodist Church. Mm -hmm. And they had a service that the whole town was invited to and encouraged everybody to wear jeans and old clothes so the truckers wouldn't feel, you know, funny about it. And the thing I remember is the hymn that was picked for us to sing was one that started out, And Yet We Are Alive. And 
it was very much a time of the town all coming together and helping the truckers and being there and being together. Um, we were very fortunate in that we didn't lose the power. I just remember the night before, my husband was in Kiwanis and he had walked up, that was when Kiwanis used to meet up at the high school, and he had walked up to it and it was a beautiful night and he said, when he came home, he said, they're nuts, it's beautiful, I can't imagine we're going to get, and then, wow, it hit. <laughs> And I don't think I went to work for a week because you couldn't get in or out of Elmore. And uh, they also, um, we had some friends that had new babies and people in snowmobiles went up to the turnpike and got trucks that had milk and stuff and brought them into town. Um, but we have pictures at home where our daughter and her friend are standing by a snow drift. It's pretty cool. <laughs> But yeah, we were lucky here. Mm -hmm. Did it affect anybody else that you knew that was um, in Elmore? People, I don't, not so much people in Elmore, but after I went back to work when I finally was able to get in, um, some of our patrons that came into Great Eastern, <coughs> they still were without power for a week because um, they had Toledo Edison, and I think Edison took care of Toledo first, and. We had patrons coming into the library that still were without power. But um, what was interesting, the following year was the year my son was born. And he was due in March. And I kept a suitcase packed in my car because I half expected, you know, to get snow in case I would have gotten snowed in at the library. And my one of my co-workers said I could, you know, stay at her house. And as it happened, it was a very mild winter, and we never had, <laughs> we didn't have a lot of snow at all. But I kept thinking of the blizzard. Of, and then also, uh, when we bought our house out in the country in 98, one of the first things we did was get a generator, uh, because I remembered how we never lost power in town, but people out in the country were without, were without power for several days. So we we do have a generator that automatically uh, kicks in if, I think, if the power has been off for 20 seconds. So uh, that made us do that. Hmm. I know you're involved in a lot of organizations in town. Um, how did you begin doing those? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Usually it started when I would be asked to be a speaker someplace, and then they asked me to join. I was originally in a group called the Pride and Joy Mothers Club, which doesn't exist anymore, and which was, we would do programs that had to do with kids, and as our kids grew up, we all, you know, weren't involved anymore. But one of the things we used to do, we'd go to their, um, their convention, yeah, that's, that doesn't work, <laughs> but we do got about 10 minutes. But, um, yeah, that I'm not sure how much we did with kids, but we, we would go to the district convention, that would be a day out all day Saturday, we'd all go together and have lunch and that would be fun. And then I was also asked to join the Elmore Study Club, which also doesn't exist, boy, <laughs> good track record here, um, which I was asked to join after I, they asked me to speak and do a book review for them, and they asked me to join afterwards, and I did, and I enjoyed it, even though I was probably the only one in it under 50 at the time, but at the time they were meeting, half of their meetings were in the evening and half of them were in the daytime. Well, as the rest of them were aging, they didn't want to go out at night anymore. So all their meetings were in the daytime and with my work schedule I had to um, quit. But they, they did eventually disband because um, the aging members, you know, they just couldn't do it anymore. And the same way with Elmore Kiwanis, I was invited to speak there, well then they invited me to join. My husband had been a member of Kiwanis at one time, 
and then because of his um, schedule, he, he dropped out. And our son and daughter were active in the Key Club. And that's part of the reason I joined Kiwanis, to support the Key Clubbers. And that's one of the things that keeps our Kiwanis group going, because we have a very active Key Club at Woodmore. And that's the only way they can have a Key Club, if they have a Kiwanis sponsor. Hmm. But uh, my daughter was secretary at Key Club when she was in high school, and Andy was actually lieutenant governor. Uh, for our district when he was in. So they were both real involved in it, and they've made friends that they have to this day through Key Club. In fact, Andy got involved at, in Circle K at Ohio mm -hmm. University, which is the college edition of Kiwanis. And his wife was also very involved in Key Club as well. But So I'm still involved in Elmer Kiwanis. Um, I'm not enough. I was actually I've, I'm the only woman that's ever been president. Mm. Uh, I was president twice, but we have a real small group. I mean, you join and then you're president. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I I was treasurer before I was officially a member, which was kind of interesting. <laughs> but yeah, I've been secretary, I've been treasurer, and I was president twice. In fact, I was supposed to be president another time. Well, then I got sick and wasn't able to do it. But, um, and I'm also involved in my church in various activities there. Speaking of when you got sick, that was uh, 2009? 2009, mm -hmm. May of 2009, I was diagnosed with oral cancer, which was on my tongue, and I had to have surgery. And n not only on my tongue, but on uh, my neck, I had lymph glands removed. And then I had a whole, basically a whole summer of chemotherapy and radiation treatments. But, uh, and I still have issues with talking and with eating, which is most frustrating. How's having the cancer change your outlook on life? I don't know. <laughs> you know, I've never thought of that. Um, maybe made me realize that time is short. Um, when I, I asked my surgeon, because people had asked me, well, what stage cancer was it? And he said stage four, which sometimes is a death sentence, but for oral cancer it isn't necessarily. And I, it actually has made me more aware of oral cancer, which I really didn't know that much about. Uh, it's always been thought of as an old man's disease because it's linked with heavy smoking and heavy drinking. And I've never smoked in my life not even in college, and, you know, it's a light social drinker. It's also been linked with the HPV virus, the same virus that causes cervical cancer, and I was tested negative for that, so I'm, I don't know why I got it, but it made me appreciate the people of this community because they were so supportive of me. I guess that's one thing that really impressed me. Um, the community... I got cards and good wishes from people I barely knew. And when I finally came back to work, not a day went by that somebody didn't come in my office and give me a hug or something like that. People in this community are wonderful. And they have they supported me so much in that illness. And my family also has, my husband, um, in fact, Amy made that comment to somebody. Um, he was very much um, a guard dog <laughs> for me. He would not let people stay long if they would come. Well, I didn't see too many people because I didn't like the way I looked. Um, I had burns all over my neck. In fact, I got a point I couldn't even look at myself in the mirror. But he was very protective of me. And when people would come, he would limit, it, limit the time that they could see me. And my sister was, too, when she came. Uh, Amy, uh, who will be the new library director, came to see me about library stuff. And my sister, she shouldn't stay so long, she, you know. But people were very protective of me, and it's made me really appreciate this community. So you're getting ready to retire next week. 
Um, Today. <laughs> this week. Well, yeah. Well, you know, we'll get through this week. <laughs> yeah, get through this week. <laughs> and um, so what, what do you think is your biggest accomplishments that you've had throughout your career? Oh, my. <laughs> Just a couple. <laughs> I think the biggest change has been automation. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the best decisions of my career here has been to um, join the SEO consortium. Uh, which wouldn't have been possible had we not had Oplan. And I was on the Library Issues Task Force for Oplan, so I got us in on the forefront with that. You know, just knowledge about it. Um, because of the fast internet service, we were able to join a consortium of, for the most part, part small libraries, and it would have been a lot more expensive had we had to go out on our own and automate this way we could you know be part of this group I'd say that is one of the things I'm happy about I'm most happy about um, I attended a conference a number of years ago called accelerating in the home stretch which was intended for directors who were around five years of retirement and one of the things they ask us is, what would you like to accomplish? And at the time, I said, I would like to see the digitization of our local history materials started. And I didn't have a clue to go how, how to go about it. And when I hired you, should I say Jennifer? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you were interested in doing it too. So I'm very glad that that was accomplished, and we are, I mean, it's a long process. It's not something that happens overnight, because there's so much material. And we were able to link with the Ohio Historical Society and the Ohio Memory Project to begin actual digitization of our local history materials. So I am glad that started on my watch, and I did apply for a grant for the Ottawa County, write a grant for the Ottawa County Community Foundation, which got us started. And then after you attended a workshop at Norweld on digitization, you talked about what we were doing, and it got Norweld on board, so we got another grant from Norweld to continue the project. So I think I'm, I'm proud of getting the ball rolling on that. Um, also proud of some of the We've had good relationships with the staff at Genoa, which, you know, I started monthly staff meetings, which were not done before. And we have our yearly Christmas party. And actually, the year we did our interior reno renovation, we were camped literally at the <laughs> Genoa Library, and we got to know the Genoa staff better. I guess I'm really proud of the interior renovation here, too. I. I think it's made it more user-friendly, uh, made the children's area a lot more attractive. Um, it's brighter. Uh, we also put a new addition on the Genoa branch, which made it roomier and gave them a meeting room, which is nice. We've had a couple people say, well, we don't have a meeting room here. I always say, well, they have the meeting room at Genoa, we have the history room, so we balance mm -hmm. each other. And then also, the big thing is passing a levy in the fall. Um, that was, we went to the public for money the first time we have ha ever had to ask for tax money for, to pass a levy. But we had no choice. Uh, with the state funding cuts, we had to cut hours, we had to cut materials, we had to cut everything. And the way our community supported us, we were thrilled to be able to the two communities came together to pass the levy, and we've been able to restore hours and get back on board. So I'm very proud of, of helping to accomplish that. We've well, done a lot in your career, then. <laughs> Phew! <laughs> um, oh, it is ten. <laughs> one more question here: um, Is there any um, programming or authors that were your, your favorites? Chris Crutcher. Yeah. Chris Crutcher, who is a well-known children's young adult author. I was so thrilled to be able to get him here. And that was, I'd say, one of the highlights of my career as well. We've had some other authors, not as well known, but that was the biggie. Mm -hmm. 
in any of the program? I know you did some for the displays, your, your chocolate. Um, we had a very talented um, staff member who was very good at doing displays. And we won all kinds of awards. We won the 53 Feet of Chocolate that came. It was a national award. We were the only library in the country that got it. And we had this huge truck full of chocolate milk and chocolate milkshakes that came to Elmore. And it was because of the displays and the creative program we did around it. Um, the program was called Drive to Read. And we decorated the Elmore car, mm -hmm. and we borrowed material from um, a local person who does racing. And so we got the community involved with that. We also won an award for a D-Day program that we had displays for uh, veterans. And that was, we won money for that. And that was so, but I think what I have done has been able to um, use the talents of my staff. I'm not saying I didn't do the displays, but I was able to use that. Mm -hmm. And I'm not doing the digitization, but mm -hmm. I was able to use your talents mm -hmm. to do that. Um, when Peggy Avers was doing our children's material, we did a community play. And by hiring Peggy and encouraging her to do that, we had, we had 200 people in here that were watching. We had teachers, we had pastors, we had local people that took part in it. They ad-libbed. It was, <laughs> it was really cool. And I guess what I feel my talent has been, not doing these things necessarily myself, but taking the talent of the staff I have and bringing it out in them. Well, I hope you enjoy your retirement, and thank you for talking with us today. Um, and you've done a lot in your career, and we thank you for doing what you do, and we will miss you, surely. <laughs> I will miss it. I, I can't deny it.